Good afternoon. I want to welcome all of you here to another one of our lectures. This is our 100th anniversary of our parish, and so we've planned a number of these lectures throughout this year just as continuing education and for us to grow in Christ. I'd like to thank all of the clergy and all the faithful who are gathered here today, uh, as well as all of you who are watching us either streaming or after the fact. We appreciate you tuning in. Today's question and lecture that I want to cover is one that clergy we hear all the time. And it's rather apropos, especially during Great Lent, because this is a time for us to focus on our faith and our commitment to Christ and to challenge ourselves to believe and have a greater greater faith in our Lord and Savior. And so this lecture is entitled, Why Does God Allow Bad Things to Happen to Good People? I'm sure that all of the clergy, all of you, we've either heard that question or asked that question at various times in our life. And so we're going to try to delve into that. So why does God allow bad things to happen to good people. This indeed is the proverbial question and one that has been discussed and mulled over and contemplated literally for centuries. It's probably the number one question which is asked of clergy and the number one cause that leads many to either leave the church, abandon their faith, or forego their belief in God altogether. It should come as no shock that we live in a world filled with pain and affliction. As a people upon this planet, we continually suffer the ravages of, uh, ravages of war, starvation, poverty, homelessness, alienation, civil unrest, persecution in the name of religion, as well as a multitude of physical and emotional and perhaps even spiritual ailments. No one, living or deceased, has been spared the harsh realities of life in this fallen world. Since the time of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, paradise was lost. Man had to eke out his living by the sweat of his brow, Life was burdensome, encumbered, and because man now knew the difference between good and evil, man's pride often inclined his heart towards evil, even from his birth, as witnessed in the event when Cain slew his brother Abel out of pure jealousy, all because God favored Abel's sacrifice over Cain's. The question as to why God allows bad things to happen is a question of the highest theological and, and a, and a deep-set matter with great mystery. It is not an easy subject to tackle or discern and is probably an even harder one to grasp, let alone be satisfied with any resolve. Perhaps... Some of the answer, just like the Twilight Zone, lies betwixt two unforeseen fixed points. As the old adage states, to those who have faith, no explanation is necessary. To those without faith, no explanation is possible. Before we go any further, Let's look again at the question itself and break it down a bit. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? First, good people. As hard as it might be to acknowledge or even admit, we must remember that there are none who are good. There are no good people. 
in the absolute sense of the word. All of us are tainted by and infected with sin. As Jesus said unto the young man who came to him, Why do you call me good? None is good but God alone. Therefore, all of us are aware of and suffer the effects of sin in one way or another. Sometimes it's our own personal sin. Other times it's the sin of others. But the fact remains, we live in a fallen world and we experience the effects of that fall. And one of those effects is injustice and seemingly senseless suffering. However, even in the face of all this, all that is wrong with this world, I still have to concur with that little Jewish girl named Anne Frank who, while hiding from the Nazis in an upper room during World War II, had the purity of heart to write in her diary, despite everything, I believe that people are really good at heart. Secondly, bad things. In wondering why bad things happen, it's also good to consider these points. Bad things may happen to good people in this world during one's earthly life, but this world is not the end. As Christians, we have eternal, an eternal perspective and know that there is life after death. Therefore, although we are aging and wasting away outwardly, spiritually we are being renewed all the time because we fix our gaze not upon what is seen but what is unseen. Thus we live and exist in a temporary life awaiting the full reward of an eternal life in God's kingdom. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for an ultimate lasting good. In the book of Romans, Paul writes, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In the Old Testament, when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, innocent of any wrongdoing whatsoever, sold solely out of jealousy. He endured and came through his horrific suffering to become the right-hand man of Pharaoh. Joseph was then able to see God's ultimate plan in all of that, which was good. For when he revealed to his brothers who he was, Joseph said about his slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things often equip believers for deeper faith and deeper spiritual life and a deeper ministry. Such instances cause us to turn to God in our times of crisis for comfort and compassion. Praise be to you, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also we comfort, our comfort abounds through Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 and 5. Bad things happen to good people, just as the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus was the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine. Therefore, as his followers, we follow in his footsteps. According to Peter's first epistle, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
when he when they hurled their insults at him he did not retaliate when he suffered he made no threats instead he entrusted himself to him who just who judges justly his heavenly father jesus is no stranger to our pain he suffered immeasurable measurable pain and humiliation at the hands of man even up to the indignation of his crucifixion loving us enough to die for us and to pay the ransom for our sins bad things happen to good people in many of these instances are purely accidental in luke's gospel the 13th chapter jesus uses the unfortunate collapse of the tower of siloam which killed 18 innocent people to remind his followers that this was in no way god's doing little is known about its construction or shape or its height but it was designed by man and suffered the flaws of man collapsing into a heap upon those who just happened to be underneath it this above account reminds me of the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis which crosses over the Mississippi River and on August 1st 2007 during the height of the afternoon's rush hour the bridge suddenly collapsed causing vehicles to plummet hundreds of feet into the river below over 100 people were injured and the incident actually claimed 13 lives which is rather miraculous considering how many cars plummeted into the river even more freakish, freakishly there's a famous incident of a woman who was canoeing on the Brule River in northwestern Wisconsin when she was killed by a falling poplar tree as she was paddling by a beaver was gnawing on the tree which just happened to give way at that moment and fell upon the woman killing her instantly just imagine that one paddle more or one paddle less might have actually spared this woman's fate accidents do happen thirdly let's look at the fact that people say god allows god allows these things to happen god allows these things to happen perhaps for a reason whether or not we are able to understand discern or even comprehend his reasonings we must always remember that our god is sovereign he is in charge he is a good god a just god a loving god and a merciful god as we proclaim during the great Prochemenon at the Vespers of Pascha, who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God who does wonders. Sadly, bad things often happen to us that we simply cannot fathom. However, instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust him trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding as the book of proverbs states thus we are called upon to walk by faith and not by sight keep in mind that god's ways are not man's ways as we read in the prophecy of isaiah for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways thus saith the lord in other words god knows the wise while we grasp for the wisdom he knows the end from the beginning while we just see the short part of the here and now in this life most things are measured by quantity and quality both from a worldly perspective but god's thinking is opposite of man's for he finds
strength in weakness, riches in poverty, wisdom in foolishness, leadership in servitude, and greatness in humility. Therefore, part of the reason we cannot fully comprehend why bad things happen is due to the fact that we don't think like God. Remember, God's wisdom is truth, mighty and vast, beyond fallen nature's comprehension. Therefore, God is, omnis is omniscient, all-knowing, and omnipotent, all-powerful. To better help or equip us to deal with the issue of bad things happening to good people, we have the Old Testament book of Job. Perhaps his story, above all others, will help us deal with this weighty matter and shed better light upon God's ways. The book of Job specifically deals with the issue of why God allows bad things to happen to good people. Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that are almost beyond belief because God was so sure of Job's faith. He allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him. And Satan did his utmost to get Job to deny and curse God. Satan destroyed Job's crops killed off his livestock, sent a storm to destroy his home and barns, killed off his family, and left Job in ruins. And as, this, and as if that wasn't enough, Satan caused all sorts of infectious, painful sores to riddle Job's body. So what was Job's reaction to all that had befallen him? Though he slay me, Yet I will hope in him. And again in that book he says, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job did not understand why God had allowed these things that he did. But he knew God was a good God and therefore continued to trust in him. Ultimately, that should be our same reaction as well as hard as that might seem. Keep in mind that God's wisdom, his way of thinking, has never promised to keep a fallen world happy or to make ungodliness comfortable. Nor was it promised to make believers happy and comfortable and free from the troubles of this world. A fallen world without storms, travesty, and tribulation is a fallacy. For God told us, if you wish to follow me, deny yourself and take up your cross. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Therefore, man has the ability to discover hope, even in the deepest moments of suffering. We can discern that we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Things are not always as they seem. That which we might think of as bad may not always be bad. Sometimes there is purpose. Sometimes there is a purpose we're simply, that we're simply not aware of or privy to. It is true that sickness, disease, death, and suffering are really bad and painful things, realities. And perhaps that God allows them might seem difficult to explain or comprehend. On the other hand, it affords us the opportunity to minister to and to help alleviate the suffering of those individuals, which is an act of love. Part of our ministry is to reach out, touch, and help heal others. Thus, nothing is one-sided. There is a back to every front, a top to every bottom, and an up to every down. In closing, 
Allow me to use this analogy of a spider walking upon an oriental carpet as an illustration. Imagine, imagine a spider walking on a very intricate oriental rug. Its eyes are down, and all it can see is a bunch of chaotic threads, various colors. But it can't discern, and it looks like it's just chaos. But if that same spider were to go and climb up to the corner of the room and spin a web and look down, it's able to see the precise intricacy, the beauty, the majesty of exactly how that carpet was made, how it was thought out and laid out and created. We don't always see that from our perspective. And it may not be until we actually die that we will be able to understand and fully comprehend these weighty matters of why God allows bad things to happen to good people. But regardless of that, I hope that in some way I've touched upon some of the things that can kind of help alleviate or answer the questions that nag us with regards to that all, all sickening question about thinking that God somehow is destructive and somehow incorporates this in a mean way. I hope that I've been able to belay to you the fact that God loves us and there is a reason for everything. But above all, I wish to thank you for your kind attention and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to address you and certainly pray that God allowed something in my words to help you in the struggle of that eternal debate of why does God allow bad things to happen to good people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.